All right, we're in 1 Timothy, studying this great book of the Bible. Uh, if you're a guest with us, uh, we have a study guide um, for you. You can pick it up on your way out if you don't already have one, or if you have been attending for a while and haven't picked up one. It's our gift to you. We want to help you know God's Word, study God's Word, learn uh, about who Jesus is through His Word. See, this is the beautiful thing about our God. He speaks to us. He reveals Himself to us. We don't have to wonder about who God is or, or how we can know Him. He came to mankind, spoke to mankind, revealed himself through mankind and to mankind. And uh, we have uh, 66 books written uh, declaring that, and that's what the Bible is. And so if you need one, go ahead and raise your hands. One of our ushers will bring you one. If you don't own one, this is our gift to you. Take it, keep it, read it. Uh, we're studying First Timothy. We are, uh, set the scene a little bit, the Apostle Paul, the, the man who's writing this book, he is on house arrest. That's where he's, he's been preaching the gospel, heralding the truth of who Jesus is. Uh, and so a lot of times you read the book of, uh, the, read the, the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote 13 letters of the New Testament, 13 books of the Bible. And so oftentimes you read some of his books and you think, man, that's just what people thought in that day. And the culture must have just been different than ours and they must have accepted what he is saying. He's in, he's on house arrest. Second, when you write Second Timothy, he's in prison, like he's about to be executed. He he's he's not preaching to a, a a culture that is like we agree with you, Paul. They actually oppose him. They oppose the gospel. So I want us to see we live in a world, we live in a country, we live in a day, we live in an age where uh, when you when you declare the truth of God's word about who he is, it may get you uh, unfriended, it may get you uh, opponents uh, who, who dislike you and disapprove of you, um, but I need you to see that that is the same type of culture that Paul is writing uh, or in, and he's writing to this young man, Timothy, the pastor, a pastor in Ephesus. A great big city, a city that would be mobilized and used mightily uh, to, to advance the gospel in the midst of hostile culture. So that's where we're at. Uh, Paul is, uh, we're continuing in chapter 1. We're going to be in verse 12. We're going to finish in verse 20 today. Uh, but the first big thing, where we're going to start today, what we need to know and what I need you to know, and this is the starting point, is uh, we must receive mercy and grace from Jesus. We all need it. If you're, a, if you're not a Christian here today and you're joining us, you need to know the goal of today's sermon and the goal of every sermon. Receive mercy and grace from Jesus. We're, we're not uh, going to bait and switch you. We're going to tell you up front, that is the objective. That is the goal. If a friend brought you, that was their goal. And if you're like, man, I feel, talk to them afterwards. And if they deny it, call them a liar. That's why we are here. We want everyone to know Jesus, to love Jesus, uh, and so that's where we're headed. Um, mer receive mercy and grace from Jesus. That's where we all must start. Now, we're going to talk about Paul a little bit. He's going to talk about his testimony. He wasn't always a, a Jesus lover. He wasn't always a, a man who, who knew God, loved God, worshipped worshiped the Lord Jesus. So if that's you, you're, the guy who's writing the book used to be in your position. I need you to see that. Here we go. Uh, verse 12. I thank him. Who has given me strength. Anyone need strength today? That's what we're at. We need strength, not self-help, but strength. That Christ Jesus, our Lord, that's who gave him strength and that's who he's thanking. He's thanking Jesus because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Sounds great. Now here's, here's his backstory. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy. Because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of the Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. We all need this strength to believe, like the Apostle Paul. So his background, his background was not a Jesus-loving Bible teacher. His, his background was a Jewish leader, um, a Pharisee, um, a very wise, a very, um, a very oh, I guess I shouldn't say wise. He was a very knowledgeable man who uh, studied God's word, knew God's word, uh, but he missed the big idea about the entire Old Testament, that it was about Jesus. He missed the big idea. It was about Jesus. And so he actually, uh, when it says he's a, a blasphemer, what that means is he dishonored Jesus. So when someone would, would tell him about Jesus or he would hear about Jesus, he would, he would not think of Jesus with honor or reverence. That's what a blasphemer does. He, he's, he's saying that Jesus, Jesus isn't real. So anyone who would oppose that Jesus is the Christ would be a blasphemer. You're like, oh, I don't like that word. Like Paul uses it about himself. Just just. 
be okay with that. Like that's, it's, it's a sin. It's something, a position that you can hold. And some of you in here might hold it. You're a blasphemer. You dishonor the Lord Jesus. You dishonor his word. If he says something, you're like, nah, I'm going to edit that. You're a blasphemer. The Apostle Paul read the whole Old Testament, knew it, memorized it, uh, sought to apply it, but he, he missed the big idea. Jesus. So he was a blasphemer. He, he, he may have thought that the atonement, the sacrifice, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus wasn't a, a real event. There are religions built around the reality that the crucifixion was fake. The Jews at that time believed that Jesus didn't raise from the dead, but, but someone uh, made an escape, uh, you know, trick and took the dead guy and made him alive somehow. It, it doesn't make any sense, but some people believe it blasphemy. It's denying his resurrection. Folks, uh, uh, in, in this time, there were, there were religious leaders who denied the resurrection. Though the Pharisees did it, he did not believe the Apostle Paul, though a Pharisee, and though he would have believed in a resurrection, did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Blasphemy. So what Paul, Paul did these things. Some of you, maybe that's your story. There's a point in time in your life in which you, uh, you heard about Jesus and you just thought, man, Christians were corny and I don't want to be a part of that. Like if that's what it, it, it just doesn't seem like something I want to be a part of. Or uh, it just doesn't seem real that a guy would die in our place for our sins uh, uh, and who doesn't know us. Uh, did it, who didn't know you personally, and you didn't know him, and he, he resurrected, meaning he defeated sin, death, and the grave. And you're thinking, man, this just is too much to be true. I don't believe it. When we, when we look at the truth of Scripture and see what God has said and revealed and is, is very true and very clear, and we say it's not true, that's, we're, we're bla- that's blasphemy. It's dishonoring. It's not giving the honor due Jesus' name. Sometimes we do that explicitly. Sometimes we do it, uh, it uh, you know, accidentally, and our hearts just don't have reverence and honor for God. That was him. So that's the guy who's writing the book. That's the one who's saying, man, I'm, I'm really excited about this Jesus guy. He says, I'm really excited because I was once a blasphemer. Uh, additionally, um, he says he was a persecutor. So if blasphemy is dishonor, persecution is seeking to destroy. Any organization or any group that would seek to silence God and his word is a, uh, is, a, is a type of persecution. Paul's persecution was through killing. It's one way to silence to everybody, just take them out. That's what Paul did. He literally watched, oversaw the project of, of uh, Stephen, after Stephen preaching the gospel, one of the first deacons in the, in the New Testament was preaching uh, the Apostle Paul gathered his goons and his crew, and, and, and they stoned. They picked up rocks and threw them at Stephen and killed him mid-sermon. The gates of heaven opened up. The sky opened. Jesus is being glorified in the heavens, and, and he's still denying it, still, still seeing uh, uh, God's mighty work and, and denying it, blasphemy, persecuting Today, in our, our day, um, we have folks that, that may call themselves Christians and they, they want to edit God's word. Uh, that, that, those are blasphemers. Persecutors are, are those who sit back and, and just watch it happen. You're like, man, that, we don't live. I love it. We live in a world that like, you're like, this isn't persecution, blah, blah, blah. You know, if they're getting killed in this state. Here's the deal. If you sit back and watch God's word be maligned, you're just as guilty as, as a blasphemer and a persecutor. This is what Jesus says. He says, if you, if you lust, then you, you, you have in your heart committed adultery. If you hate, you've committed murder. Like, the New Testament doesn't just take the Ten Commandments and take the law, moral law of God and just and, and nullify it, but it, it, it actually amplifies it. The Apostle Paul is saying, I mean, I watched Stephen get stoned. I made it my job to kill Christians. He, he was a Christian killer. He would approve and watch Christians get mutilated and destroyed. Additionally, he says he's an insolent opponent. So he was not only a blasphemer, which means he dishonored God. Then he tried to destroy the work of God through persecution. And then he was an insolent opponent. He said, I was on the other team. There's like Jesus and Satan. I was on Satan's team. I was not only killing Christians, but I was, I, was, I was creating systems and structures that would help destroy and dismantle Jesus and his church. I was an insolent opponent. I was on the other team. I not only I, I dishonored God, but I disrespected him and his people and his church. I had great disrespect for Jesus. Great disrespect for, for church, for Christians. 
That's what he's saying. But he says, but. So that's Paul. That's Paul. That's the guy who's writing the book. He's, he, is, he is a former blasphemer, dishonoring God, former persecutor, meaning he just tried to tr- destroy the work and movement of God. And he was an insolent opponent, meaning he was on the other team. Not on team Jesus, but was willfully opposed to Jesus. That's what an opponent means. He was, he, was an, he was opposed to Jesus. That's him. And what does he say? But, but I received mercy. It's the big point. You must receive mercy and grace from Jesus. He he received mercy. And he was judged faithful. So you should be asking, what the heck, by what standard was he judged faithful? Because it seems like he was like faithful opponent, faithful persecutor, faithful blasphemer. But don't really see like his his lineage of uh, Christian faith here. How was he faithful? If you'll remember, we, we, we discussed this when we first opened the book of uh, 1 Timothy, and we, we saw Paul's journey uh, uh, to head to persecute Christians in Acts. He was headed to kill some Christians. And Jesus showed up. It, literally, Paul was riding on his horse, and Jesus kicked him off. Just like he, he didn't lovingly tap me, knocked him off and blinded him. He had to get his attention. Some of you, that's your story. You were an opponent of Jesus, and Jesus showed up in a, in a radical, mighty way and just, and just kind of like put your lights out. That's what he did to Paul. Jesus showed up. And Jesus told Paul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you trying to shut down the movement of God? Why are you opposing me? And it was in this moment, in this interaction with Jesus, that Paul goes from a Christian killer to a Christian he puts his faith not in, 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 in his, his former ways, but in his new way, into the only way, into the, the God-man Jesus. He believes in Jesus. See, by what standard can he be judged faithful? It's the standard of Christ. The same way you, can, you and I can be judged faithful. See, what Jesus did was he, in his life and ministry, uh, culminated in him taking the place of sinners, being crucified in the place of sinners. And through Jesus' Mercy through Jesus' grace, Paul has become saved, become a Christian. And so he says, I've received mercy. I received mercy. He said, I, he says he received mercy because uh, I acted ignorantly in unbelief. What he is not saying is that this is a uh, an excuse or justification. What he's doing is he's building his argument. Uh, uh, his argument to Timothy is that there are, he's about to talk about those who uh, those false teachers who have abandoned the faith. And he's t- saying that he, he was never a Christian and acted as an opponent of Christ. He was never a Christian and he was a persecutor. He was never a Christian and, and he, he, he blasphemed. And he's about to talk about guys who were Christians, who he kicked out of the church, who, who they were, quote, Christians, and they've blasphemed as well. They are, they've become opponents of Jesus and his church as well, so Paul kicks them out of the church. This is what he's, he's, he's saying is that he's not in, in, ignorant in the sense that he is, uh, that means he's innocent. He's saying that, that, see, it's normal for a non-Christian to act like a non-Christian. Oftentimes we want non-Christians to act like Christians and, and they don't have the ability to because they don't have the spirit of God in them. So we want them to just be moral. Morality without Jesus is still damnable. Like, I don't, this is not, that's cool that they... Maybe uh, have your values, but they don't have your Christ. They don't have your Savior. And so it's far too often Christians are so content with, with the world around us just being more moral and not being Christian, like not being saved. Paul says non-Christians act like non-Christians. You should expect that. But then he's contrasting it. He's, he's saying Christians should be like Jesus. That's what the word means. And he's going to kick two guys out of the church because they, they, they blaspheme, they dishonor Jesus. They, they deny what Jesus has made clear. They believe false teachings and they teach false teachings that are leading people not towards salvation, hope, redemption, and life, but towards death. The other team, Satan, demons. And it looks kind of normal because it's guys, it's Christianity. So Paul is contrasting, he's saying, hey, when I was a, a non-Christian, I act like a non-Christian. But Jesus saves non-Christians. It's the only people he saves. And so that's the, or before we get to the next point, he says it was in, um, he, we acted in his unbelief, and it was the grace of the Lord that overflowed. 
I want you to see this, this, the, the mercy and grace in Jesus abounds. There's more mercy and grace in the Lord Jesus than sin in you. You're like, I got a lot of sin. You don't have near as much sin as mercy and grace in Jesus. Jesus has incredible amount of mercy and grace. So what Paul is doing, he's contrasting uh, acting like a non-Christian uh, or, or his life of, of being a non-Christian in comparison to those so-called Christians who, are now become, who have now become false teachers. And his plea to us is to receive mercy, receive grace, just like he did. It's a gift to be received. It's an overflowing gift to be received. He says, like, it's like you can't contain it. Imagine if you've ever done this. If you have kids and they fill up their water bottles, this is how they do it. They just fill it up until it starts overflowing. You're like, you know, you could have stopped a few seconds earlier and, like, you wouldn't have this mess. And every time uh, my kids do it, I, I'm trying to teach myself to go, you know what? That's overflowing. That's grace. That's the abound. Like, we want to just get enough. Enough of Jesus, enough of his grace. Like, we don't, he has abounding mercy abounding, overflowing grace that he wants you to experience. He wants you to, if your, your cup has ever overflowed, um, it gets everything else wet around it. God wants to lavish his mercy and grace on you so that it not just fills you up, but overflows into your life and affects everything you, you touch, every person you encounter. He says it's overflowed for me with, with the faith, get, see this, with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Jesus' love overflowed to Paul. I want you to see this. This is the Jesus' love, his mercy and grace overflowed to the Apostle Paul, who at the time, at, the, at, at receiving that mercy and grace, was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a insolent opponent. You cannot outsin the mercy and grace of Jesus. And Jesus loves you so much, he will be relentless in his pursuit. If he has to knock you off a horse and blind you, he will. And you're like, I don't ride a horse. But one day, someone, you're going to be, you know, on vacation doing the horse thing, and you think you're cool, and you're going to get knocked off, and you're like, man, I need to go plant churches. Uh, maybe that's you. Maybe that's you. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul. And this, this faith overflows from Jesus to the Apostle Paul. Notice, it's not faith that originated with him. It's not love that originated with him. It was an overflow. Jesus granted him the faith. Jesus granted him the love. The love that he has for, for, for Jesus came from Jesus. Not only did Jesus look upon him in his rebellion and sin and said, I want you in my family, but he says, I'm going to give you the faith to believe. I'm going to give you the love to believe. I want you to see the mercy and grace. That's what mercy and grace does. It overflows. Mercy is us receiving or, or not receiving what we should receive, punishment for our rebellion. Paul should have received punishment, but he received mercy, which means hit the wrath of God was withheld from him. He graces, he receives something he didn't deserve, salvation. If you were in Christ, you've received mercy. The, the wrath of God has been diverted from you to Jesus. And the mercy, or that's mercy, and the grace of God has been extended to you. You did not deserve to be a child of God, but, but, he, uh, but, but Jesus has made you a part of the family through faith. That's the news. That's great. And Paul's eager to teach it. That's, the, that's where we start. Next, we see that Jesus came to save sinners. That's Jesus' mission. That's Jesus' mission. That's the church's mission. That's Jesus' mission. I don't know how we've gotten off track from that. He's going to say it very, very clearly. Jesus' mission was not being a, just simply a good teacher. Actually, the one time he called the guy, the guy called him a good teacher, he rebuked him and sent him away. That's the rich young ruler. He does not, he's not a good teacher. He is God in the flesh. He came to save sinners. Jesus had a mission, and it's very, very clear. He's not a philanthropist. He's Savior. That's who Jesus is. Verse 15, it says this, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, meaning if you don't accept this, you should today. That's what, that's what repentance is, is believing, trusting this very statement that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, whom I am the foremost it's so the Apostle Paul seeing himself in his, his sin. He sees that Jesus came to save sinners, and he's like, I'm really, really, really guilty. 
Notice he doesn't say like many teachers will, will say today, uh, that we, we, we often try to, in our day, to distance ourselves from the word sinner. I hear it all the time. No, you're not a sinner, you're a saint. Yeah, you're simultaneously sinner and saint. You've got to understand that. That is the message of the New Testament. You're simultaneously a sinner and a saint. Paul doesn't say, I was once, he said he was once, right, a blasphemer. He was once a persecutor. He was once an insolent opponent of of Jesus. But he says here that I am the foremost sinner. See, when you become a Christian, you don't don't just stop sinning, though by the power of grace of God you uh, you cease to do the things you once did by the power of grace of God, but you realize the sin runs so much deeper. That your thoughts matter. Your intentions matter. It's not just what you do. It, it, sin is, is permeated to the core of who we are. And the more we understand the mercy and grace of Jesus, the more we, we're, we're aware that, man, we're, we're, we're worse than we thought we were. Some of you think other people are just really, really, really awful people. And you're like, I can't believe God could save them. It, Paul's like, no, I'm the worst. And you're like, well, I'm sure like Hitler was worse than Paul. Paul's like, no, nah, I was the worst. Now, this isn't a point that he's making that it's who's the worst sinner. What he's saying is that at the core of, 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 of mankind, we've rebelled at such a deep level that we are, we, we are, the more we walk with Jesus, the more we are aware of the depths of our sin. Now, he doesn't say that I, he wears the badge of sinner and he's solemn and he's walking around going, I'm just so depressed. I'm such a sinner. What he's saying is that he's glorying in the fact that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Like if you're not a sinner, then you don't need saving, right? Only sinners can be saved. So if you don't want to join Team Sinner, even though you already are, like you can't join Team Jesus. That's the entrance. It's the admission that you are guilty and that he is Savior. That's how you get in. That's how you start. That's how you're sustained. Now, he says, I'm the foremost. He says, but I receive mercy. So why does he say this? He says, I receive mercy for this reason, that in me the foremost, meaning the foremost sinner, Christ might display his perfect patience. Meaning this, that there's there's no sin that you can commit that can keep you from the love, the mercy, and grace of Jesus. He said, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what your thought life is. I don't care what you've done. You could have killed Christians, organized a whole, you know, killing Christians organization, and sought to destroy Jesus and his church. But if Jesus saves you, you believe that he is your God, he is your Savior, he died in your place for your sins, you exchange your life for his mercy and grace forevermore. He's saying, man, God has been, was very patient with me. He was perfect in his patience. He was great in his patience towards me. That while I was blaspheming, while I was persecuting, while I was an insolent opponent, Jesus was patient. We're told this, that the the, the kindness and, uh, and the patience of God are to lead us to repentance. And they led him to repentance. And he says that, so he, he is the, he, God saved him so that he can be an example is what he's saying. To be example, he says, as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Paul's an example that Jesus can save anybody. Do you believe that? Do you believe, do you believe in Jesus? Is Jesus your hope? You were once, like the Apostle Paul, rebellious. And Jesus has extended mercy and grace to you. If you've not received mercy and grace from Jesus, we invite you to do that. That is, that is your response. So Paul goes from from Christian killer and persecutor to preaching missionary. That's amazing. Like, that's amazing. What if you would have told Paul, like, hey, you know, maybe 20 minutes before he got converted when he was going to kill Christians, like, hey, one day you're gonna be a preacher of Jesus. You make no way. I will never you can never in a million years. And now he could then <laughs> Jesus shows up. Some of you that's your that's your story. Never in a million years would you become a Christian. But Jesus showed up. 
And so he goes from a, a, a Christian killer to preaching missionary. The reason is, is because he's marveling and he's, he's amazed that Jesus could save a guy like him. That's what he says. He's an example. He's marveling at the fact that Jesus can save a guy like him. Jesus can even save a, a guy or gal like you. That should amaze you. You should, not, you should not think you're so awesome that, like, man, there was Jesus in you and, you, and he got lucky to have you on the team. If not, like, I hope you see that you are the foremost sinner today. <laughs> That's where you got to get. If you feel like, so if you feel like you're kind of good and everyone else is not that good and you're better than everybody else, you need to see that you are, I'm going to watch my words here, uh, the worst sinner. If you were here today and you see yourself as, as such, a, such a wretched sinner, you need to see that Jesus' mercy and grace extends to you. So Some of you beat yourself up and you, you nullify the mercy and grace of Jesus and you don't marvel that Jesus can save you. Some of you need to do that. Some of you marvel that Jesus can save someone else, but you're not marveling at the fact that he can save you. I need you to get there today. You are way worse than you think you are. Your way, and the answer is not to tell the person who, who is really struggling and seeing their sin over and over. You're just better than you think you are. No, Jesus is better than all of you and all of us and all of our sin and all of our guilt and all of our shame. That even when we were dead in our sin, rebelling against him, and we were blasphemers, we were even persecutors, we were even opponents of Jesus, he died in the place of us, sinners. He died for us. He died for his opponents, his enemies, to make them friends. It's amazing. And Paul is like, this is so amazing. i got to tell people. And this is, this is how we should respond as well. We should want to tell everybody. We tell people what movies we like. We even tell them multiple times. I saw this movie. You should really go see it. Next week, did you see it? No. You should really go see it. Oh, it's on HBO Max now. You should look. Like, we are evangelists for stupid things. We're really, really, really good evangelists for stupid things. You're like, wow, that movie was good. It's stupid compared to Jesus. He is the most marvelous, precious, priceless gift one could receive. And Paul's like, I was such an opponent. I could care less what people think. I'm going to just keep preaching until they put me in prison or chop off my head, which both get to happen. And he's just like, I'm an example that Jesus can save anybody, anybody. What if you have a different uh, ideology or background? He's like, I, I was that. He can save anybody. What if you grew up in a religious organization that thought they knew about God? I, I did that too. Anybody, anybody. And he's so passionate. He's so passionate. It's so interesting that we're willing to share YouTube videos, but we're not willing to share Jesus. Like, well, someone might... Not like that. I know. Paul knew that. He said, he's, he's writing this from being on house arrest. He would have zoomed in if he could, but he had to write a letter. But he's pumped. He is so pumped because of Jesus that he breaks into song here. He bursts into praise. So he's talking about the, Jesus came to save sinners, that he is the foremost. His grace is on display. In verse 7, he jumps into just being absolutely pumped. He says, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, to be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You're like, I didn't know we were praying. He's like, I just did. I was just talking. All of a sudden, I burst into prayer, really, really excited. Jesus is awesome. That's what Paul's doing. So not only is Paul an example to us that you can be saved, but he's an example to us that we are called to be on mission. He's, we, we should not just see that he's an example that Jesus saves sinners, but he's an example that Jesus saves sinners and sends us on a mission. That's the example we see here with Paul. He's like, he's like God is transcendent. God is the king, all power and glory. He's immortal. He's invisible. He is awesome. All the glory and power forever be to him. He's awesome. He says he's that, yet, think about it. We often believe that God is immortal. He's invisible. He's all powerful, but he's distant, Right? Many of you have thought that God is all that, but he's just distant. He doesn't intervene in human life. He doesn't really care about my needs. He's just, he's really big, really powerful, really awesome, I think, but like he's distant. No, Paul is connecting that. He's saying he intervenes personally into the world to save his people. That's what he means when Jesus 
came into the world to save sinners. Meaning Jesus left heaven, clothed himself as a man, lived a life in your place, in the Apostle Paul's place, for your sin. He lived a perfect life in your place. Meaning you cannot live a perfect life. You cannot live a sinless life. Jesus came into the world to live a life that you and I cannot live. He did not just heal people. He did not just cast out demons from people. He did not just do great and mighty works for people. He came to save people, which meant he had to live a sinless life and then atone for the sins of sinners, of mankind. So when Jesus is brutally beaten and hung up on the cross to be executed and murdered, he's doing that For sinners, he's doing it for you and me. He's hanging in your place. He's hanging in my place. He's hanging in the Apostle Paul's place. He's he's hanging in the place of sinners. He's dying a death that we deserve so that we could have the reward that he earned in our place. Salvation, perfection, redemption. Meaning when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, Jesus takes all of your sin and you receive all of his perfection, his righteousness. When that, which means that right now, you're simultaneously, though sinner, you are righteous saint, justified, forgiven, adopted, cleansed, clean. Amazing. Wouldn't you want people to know that? Like, hey, do you, re- like, this is crazy news. And that's all that the gospel is, is simply news. It's news. The news is that Jesus has paid the, paid the penalty. The news is that Jesus has paid the penalty. Would you receive that gift? That's the, that's the response. And so Paul is not just an example that we, are, that, that we can be sinners saved, but he's the example of, of the mission. Oftentimes we want the, we want the uh, theology of Paul, but we don't want the, the missiology of Paul, to live the life on mission like Paul. But Paul wants Timothy to do that. So he tells him this. He says, wage the good warfare. That's what is, is, in light of all this, the response of of this great mercy, great grace, sinners being saved, the response of this is that, hey, Timothy, let's get to work. Let's get something done. He says this, this charge, he's not suggesting, he's not uh, dialoguing. He's saying this is a charge coming from a commander to, to this dude, Timothy. Hey, get this thing done. I entrust to you. You've been entrusted. You must be found faithful. He says it's a father to a son uh, and, and authority to someone subordinate. He says this I charge you or this I, I charge, I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you. By them may you wage the good warfare, holding faith with a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have shipwrecked their faith. Among those are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. We live in a legitimate spiritual war. Even now, even now, in in the unseen realm, uh, Angels and demons have showed up to, to war. If, if the unseen realm were to be made visible to us, it would kind of freak you all out, all of us. We'd be like, whoa, is that real? Like, yes. And it's not like the movies. It'd be crazier. Like, s- angels are not, uh, you know, things that, you, that are fluffy and look like babies. They're like warriors. They're winged, armed, swords, warriors. They're fighting in the, in, in the spiritual realm now. And, they will, and when we leave, we literally wage war, as, the, as Paul tells other, the other churches in the New Testament. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle, however, against principalities and spiritual, spiritual powers of darkness in the heavenly places, the unseen realm. There's, there's literally a war going on for your soul. There's a war going on. And, and, it's, and it's like a wrestling match. If you've ever wrestled or done any hand-to-hand combat, it's exhausting. Anyone fought, you became a Christian, you're like, man, this is exhausting. Paul is telling Timothy, I know it's exhausting, but wage war, like a uh, wage the war, uh, wage, you may wage the good warfare, like fight well. He says that there's a reality that there is a battle. See, what is the battle? It's not against uh, flesh and blood. It's, it's against ideologies, it's against principalities of darkness. It's against what we believe 
Anything that would deny God for who he is as he's revealed himself, we wage that that's where the war's taking place. It's, it's a war oftentimes in our mind. It's a war about who we will worship. We worship Jesus or we worship false gods. God has an enemy. We need to understand this. The kingdom of heaven has enemies. And, and, and the enemy, Satan, has blinded the eyes of many. That, they, in, that in the physical realm, so the war is taking place in the, in the unseen realm, but it's manifesting itself out in the, the physical realm. So there are people who, uh, you got to see this, anyone who doesn't know, love, or trust Jesus, their eyes have been blinded. They are bound captive. They're prisoners of war. They're not your enemy. They're not your enemy. Their ideologies may oppose God, and we, we have to refute those. But the human is a, is a soul that God created that, that has an eternity. They need to hear this good news and be set free. That's why we got to preach it. That's why Paul's so excited. But he's telling Timothy, hey, it's a war, though. And you're a part, so in you, Timothy, and us, church, we're part of the greatest mission in the entire world. You need to see this. And if you don't believe this, I pray and pray and pray and pray by the end of our time in Timothy that you would see that the cause of Christ is the greatest cause to ever be a part of. It, there is no hashtag group, organization, or anything in the entire world that can compare to, to the cause of Christ. There's nothing but the cause of Christ enters in to, to real time and real lives and a real world for a real mission to, to redeem, to set captives free, to, to herald the news that Jesus came to save sinners. He has made atonement for your sin. Will you believe? And pleading with people to believe, pleading with them to trust, pleading with them to obey. And God has chosen you and us to be born in a particular time, in a particular day and age. You live where we live now for this purpose. Acts 17 says for this divine exact purpose that you live exactly where you live today so that you and others may know Jesus. That's why God has put you here. Like why wasn't I born in the 1700s or whatever weird year y'all want to wish you lived in? Like he puts you here now. Don't wish you lived at another time. Glory in the fact that God created you, knit you together in your mother's womb, allowed you to be born in this country, in this day, in this age, and experience what you've experienced through sin that you've committed, sin committed against you, yet he never forsook you, forsought you, whatever. He pursued you passionately to the point of salvation, to the point that you're here today on purpose. He loves you and he wants to, to, to redeem you and continue to restore you and to continue to use you as an example for those who may have experienced similar things that you, that Jesus saves, redeems, restores, helps, changes. He's chosen you to be here in this day, in this city, for this time, for however long you're here. Don't squander it. Don't miss it. For here. And if you don't know Jesus, then he's brought you here to this church to this day to believe, to trust, to forsake any other faith that you held and trust Jesus. And if you don't believe in Jesus, you need to know this, that the enemy has kept you captive. How many of you are being told that you were a captive and a prisoner of war want to go, yeah, let's stay here? But that's the lie of the enemy thing, causing you to believe that God has something different for you, that, that being a captive is better. Imagine having chains, your hand in chains, your wrist in chains. Some of you, uh, you have this feeling when you, um, I shouldn't compare it, never mind. Uh, the wrist in chains. And, and, and after years and years of years of, of having your wrist chained, they're taken off. The grooves from the chains are still pressed into your wrist. The feeling of the chains, the weight might be gone, but, but it's so familiar. You understand the, the chains more than you understand freedom. It just feels normal. That's you if you're, if you're not in Christ. What feels normal is slavery. Slave to your passions. Slave to rebellion against God. You're trapped. 
God is assembled, is assembling a, a, a team, a mission team, a church here in San Antonio to push back darkness, to herald the good news that Jesus saves sinners. And to tell those, and I want to tell you if you don't believe in Jesus, that, that right now the chains have been obliterated through the death of Jesus. You are free to leave your cell. You are no longer a prisoner. If you indeed want to walk out with faith in Jesus, eyes on him, he's ready to receive you. The work has been finished. The response is faith. So there's this great mission to herald that. But additionally, there's an enemy's assault that's aimed directly at you believing that. It's the, the enemy's assault is aimed at not just keeping you in unbelief, but then aimed at the Christian's faith as well. There's a Christian, there's a real assault on your faith and the faith of your family. Husbands, your wives, wives, your, your, your husband, your kids, your, your, your family. There's, a, there's, a, there's an attack, and it's not, it's, it's on the faith. Verse 9, this is what, or 19, this is what he says. He says, Wage the good warfare, in verse 18, he says, holding, uh, uh, wage the good warfare of faith, holding to the faith, right? By rejecting it, some have shipwrecked their faith, holding faith with a good conscience, he says, holding faith. What he's saying is this, this holding of faith is, literally means one of the two things. It means that you're wearing faith or you're owning faith. So the two images of this is, is faith in Jesus means that you, you move from one team and you put on the new team's jersey. You were once on the away team, now you're on the home team. The, the kingdom of heaven, you, you get a new jersey. The other thing is, is, is the other way this holding of faith with a clear conscience is owning faith, not me, meaning you possess it, meaning this, that you're not borrowing it from your parents any longer, but it's your own. Timothy was borrowing his faith from his grandmother to his mother to, to now his, he's holding it his, his himself. And he's saying the, the enemy's attack is going to be on your faith to cause you to disbelieve God, to distrust God, to, to, to question his word, to question his authority, to, to question God's love and care for you. This is exactly what the enemy told Eve. Hey, did God really tell you to eat that, not to eat that fruit? Answer, yes, he really told me not to. Satan, shut up. That's what he should have said. Actually, Adam should have also said it, but anyway. Like, did God say that? Yes, he said it. Well, then he must be withholding from you. No, he's not. Well, he, he, he doesn't want you to become like him. I'm already like him. That's how it should have went down. But what did Eve do? She believed the lie, and Adam believed it as well, that, that God did not have his best for them. He, 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 the, the enemy calls him to believe that, that God wasn't trustworthy. So the enemy will do this, and, and it'll cause you to think that God's not trustworthy because of other Christians. This is why, like, we got to admit, like, we're sinners in process. If you, your faith is built upon the, the faith of someone else and the righteousness of someone else other than Jesus... You're not following the God of the Bible. That's not Christianity. Don't trust people. Don't put your faith in people for, for, your, for your hope, for your salvation. Put your trust in God. That's where life is. That's the good news. It's not, oh, man, Christians, man. Because Paul is saying, he's, he's about to name some guys, right? He's going to name some guys who shipwreck their faith. And if you're like, man, that's the faith. Man, if I'm looking at Hymenaeus and Alexander, like they really hurt me. They really caused me to believe certain things. Like, man, I'm just, it may be real hurt, real pain. It's real. But Hymenaeus and Alexander got kicked out of the church because they're being fools. And they're, they're, they're teaching false things. Where Paul is telling Timothy, hey, the, the war is going to be waged. And it's going to be an attack and an assault, a full-out assault on your faith. To cause you to distrust God, to question his word, his authority. Additionally, there's going to be attack on your identity. It's another way the enemy attacks. He, he, and we live in a world, and this is subtle. The world tells us, the world we live in, we talk about identity. Be who you are. Be who you are. Sounds good, huh? God loves you for who you are. It's very true, he does, uh, but he doesn't keep you for who you are. But the point is, like, be who you are. Be who you are. And so this is what the enemy will do. Just bear with me for a second. Who you are is not good enough. Who you are is a broken person. Who you are is a sinner in need of saving. 
Any of you feel that way? You're like, man, I feel like I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough at my work. I'm not good enough with my spouse. I'm not, I'm not good enough in my life. This work doesn't want me. People my whole life have been told I was not good enough. I never got picked for the team. I, was never, I just don't feel good enough. See, the, and the world will say, like, that's okay. Be who you are. Okay, you want to be who you are? Not enough? All right, go ahead. Be who you are. Not enough. Sinner. Abandoned. Who needs saving. See, the difference between the world's be who you are and what the Bible teaches, the Bible doesn't teach be who you are. It says be whose you are. Jesus looks at you Though you are not good enough to earn your own salvation and says, that's okay, I will take your place for your sins. I will make a way to you to be in my family with my life. I will bleed out. I will be brutally murdered for you. That's love. I love you that much that I will take the cross to buy you back in the family. Why? Because you are not good enough. Only he is. Only he is. So Jesus takes folks who are not good enough, who are rejected, who are rebellious, who are broken, who are sinners, and says, I want you to be in my family. You may have been a blasphemer like Paul. You may have been a persecutor like Paul. You may have been an opponent like Paul, but I love you. But I will pay for you to be in my family. So it doesn't matter who you are. What matters is whose you are. And he adopts you. That's Christianity. It's about whose you are, not who you are. So who you are. Think about all the, the negative things you believe of who you are. And then just be reminded today, but God. But God loves me. But God is enough. But God saved me. But God forgives me. But God died for me. But God, uh, Jesus lived his life for me. This is great news. I'm a mess, but God. Where do you find yourself today? The story that Jesus is writing is not over, but God. But God. Additionally, he says this, that he says you need to hold to that faith to, to wear the faith, to own the faith with a good conscience, meaning your whole being. What he's doing is contrasting the false teachers who have rejected, uh, who have rejected their conscience and believed the lies and false teachings. He says in verse 19, Hold to the faith with a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have shipwrecked their faith. Among them, or among, uh, among who are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. He's saying that, that they, they did not hold to the faith with good conscience. They, they did not own the faith. They did not believe the faith. They actually reject their conscience. They, in their conscience, they rejected the faith and believed lies. It's what we're told in Romans 1, that, that all of mankind has suppressed the truth. We've, we've, we've worshipped the creator, or the creation, rather than the creator. We've exchanged a truth about God, and we've exchanged it for a lie. That's what, that's what mankind has done. See, in this war, in this great mission that we're on, there will be casualties. Hymenaeus and Alexander are casualties. They were once Christians. They were part of the church. Now they've exited, and they've, they've deconstructed to the point where they have never reconstructed their faith. They've abandoned the faith. They got kicked out of the church. And so some of you are like, man, this seems harsh. But what he's saying is that they did this. They rejected the faith. They rejected Jesus. They rejected God and his word. They, they became editors, not preachers and proclaimers. And it led to being shipwrecked. If you've been shipwrecked at sea, I know none of you have. But imagine with me if you have. Like, this would be awful. They're drowning at sea. He's saying they're drowning Hymenaeus and Alexander, and they don't realize they're drowning. We're saying, hey, put on the life jacket. They're like, dude, I'm okay. I like the waves. I like surfing. They're going to drown. So Paul calls two of these men out. See, the interesting thing is, is that Paul understands what it's like to be on the wrong side of the war. He knows what it's like to be an insolent opponent. 
He's looking at Hymenaeus and Alexander and saying, hey, why did, you, why did you go from being a part of Team Jesus to opposing him now? And so what, what they probably di- didn't believe that they were opposing, they probably call themselves Christians still, but they were editors of God's word. They, they were changing what God has said and made clear. And so what Paul does is he kicks them out. He rebukes them. He hands them over to Satan. He says he does this, why? To, so they would learn not to blaspheme. It's interesting that he says this because remember what Paul said? He was once a blasphemer. He was once a blasphemer. But blasphemers, he's saying, don't belong in the church. They're not Christians. He said they can attend, they can be a part, but they're not Christians. Don't call them Christians anymore if they don't believe things that are Christian. That's what he's saying. He's saying, discipline them. Let them suffer the consequences of them shipwrecking their faith. In our day, you're like, man, that sounds harsh. But you got to understand, Paul understands what it's like to be on the other side. It was on the other side that, that when, when he lost everything, when he had nothing but his own selfish ambition, that Jesus showed up and rebuked him. And he's saying, hey, we're going to hand him over and let God do the same thing. Go let him. If he's, if he's, you got to see this. What he is saying is that Hymenaeus and Alexander, they call themselves Christians, but they're preaching the doctrine of Satan. Go hand him over. This is, may sound harsh, but if anyone edits God's word, hand, they're preaching Satan. Jesus calls Peter this as well. When Peter says, hey, Jesus, you don't have to die. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight for you. No one's going to kill you, Jesus. I'm going to take your place. I'm going to become your substitutionary atonement. I'm going to fight for you. He says, get behind me, Satan. And that was the guy who Jesus used to start the church I need you to see when we edit God's word, we become complicit participants with the lies of the enemy. And Paul's very passionate, and, it wants, and the reason why the purpose of this is, is, is multi, and three, I'm going to give you three reasons what the person, purpose of this. Number one, if they call themselves Christians and don't believe the Bible and teach what the Bible says, they're not a Christian, don't call them that. That's what he's saying. He's like, well, that just seems unfair. If they identify as that, nope, he doesn't care. It's like having a Spurs jersey and knowing a bunch of facts about Tim Duncan, but you are not an NBA player. Like, I don't care if either you're in the NBA or you're not. It doesn't matter what jersey you have. It doesn't matter how many stats you can quote. Either you know Jesus and love Jesus and Jesus saved you and you, and you believe what Jesus is saying or you're not a Christian. That's, that's, those are the, that's very clear. But additionally, he, he's drawing a clear line so that others in the church don't get deceived. And this is what the church has done a Really poor job of this. And Paul's writing because he's really passionate about people understanding Jesus as he's revealed himself. And people are getting deceived. Loved ones are getting deceived. Families are being split. People are being deceived because of Hymenaeus and Alexander. And Paul is like, they're not even Christians. They claim to be Christians. They're preaching a different gospel. And they're, they're editing God's word. They are not Christians. Church, kick them. They, they're not Christians. This matters because they're deceiving other people. They've joined Satan's team and they're trying to take people from the ranks of of the church and, and deceive them into believing lies. Paul is like, understands this so much because he, that was him. You have to see that Paul is so passionate about this because he understands what it's like to, to be an opponent, to, to siphon Christians away from their Lord and Savior Jesus, to persecute them and to harass them and try to get them to forsake the cause of Christ. It's, he's doing this out of love. I need you to know this. If you come to my house and have dinner and start telling my kids that I don't love them and I'm not for them, I'm kicking you out. No questions. Out. If you do it as a joke, I'm kicking out too after this. Like you don't joke about God, God's love for his people. You don't edit God's word. You don't teach another doctrine. And so Paul is like, hey, this is not my church. This is Jesus' church. Jesus rules this. Jesus' authority. Jesus' power. Whatever the word of God says, we submit to. That's what he's saying. That's why he's so passionate. He's not because he's mean. It's not because he's unloving. It's because he, he loves Jesus and his church and wants people to not be led astray. The third reason why I think he does this is he, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, he speaks to this type of discipline is so that they may be saved. 
hand, in 1 Corinthians, Paul goes into greater length in chapter 5 and says that he's handing over to Satan so that they may hit the rock bottom, they may experience the results of their shipwrecked faith, and then come back home. Like the prodigal son who left, that they may come home. The purpose of discipline, this type of discipline, I need you to see this. The purpose of discipline is not to punish for the sake of punishment, but it it is to restore. It's for for God's people or for for these rebellious people to hit rock bottom and then bounce back, come back in repentance and be restored to the church and and, and to, to Jesus. That's the goal. And so where are you at? Where are you at? Some of you need to be, are you, have you been rebellious and you need to be restored back to Jesus? You've wandered away. You've believed lies. You, got so, you cared so much about the culture thinks, not what Jesus thinks. Maybe you're, you're at a position where you're just struggling with your faith. You're just like, I'm just struggling. Like, I feel the, the attacks on my faith. I've questioned whether I want to be a Christian, questioned uh, uh, my faith, just questioned a lot. There's a lot of things that I've seen, a lot of things that have been done, I, re- reading blogs, podcasts. Just, I'm just, just really unsure, and, and I'm just, if I'm honest, I'm struggling. Is that you? Is that you? If that's you, then I want to encourage you. In Mark 9, 24, I believe, it says that, that this man was struggling in his, his belief, and he prayed. He says, I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. Be honest. If that's you, you're like, man, I'm struggling. Be honest. But don't be honest to the point of, I'm going to go figure some new things out and then come back to Jesus. No, be honest with Jesus. I'm struggling. I believe in you, Jesus, but help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Maybe uh, you're aware of what's been, that God's word hasn't been speaking into your life or forming your thoughts, but rather the rebellious culture we live in and find ourselves in. That we are to be in the world but not of it doesn't mean we don't participate. We absolutely do, but we're not formed by it. But we reform culture. That's what our mission is. Some of you need to resolve to to actually step up to the plate, to actually wage good warfare, to not sit on the sidelines, but to be active. Some of you need to resolve and and repent uh, for not sharing the gospel, for not heralding this good news. Some of you need to repent for thinking that you're, you're not that great of a sinner. That other people are really bad, but you're not that bad. It's called pride. It's arrogance. It keeps you from, from, from relationship with God. Repent of your rebellion. Repent of your pride. Repent of your, your, the things you've done, but also maybe the things you've left undone. You haven't participated in the mission. Maybe your response is that you need to join, get involved in the greatest mission, the greatest cause in human history. Maybe some of you are a casualty. You've been sniped by the enemy's arrows. You've deconstructed your faith. You've abandoned it. You grew up maybe in a religious home or or, or in a home where you heard about Jesus. And you've gone from maybe having pseudo faith to being full on abandoned faith. You've become a, a blasphemer of Christ. Will you hear this again that that? Paul is an example to anyone and everyone in here today that no matter what you've done or who you are, that Jesus came to save sinners. And you don't have to be defined by who you are or what you've done or what sin has been done against you, but you can become Christ's. You can go from who you are to whose you are and whose are you. Are you Satan's or are you Jesus's? You can respond today with that. Some of you are, are, are very aware that you're in a battle. You feel the spiritual warfare. You feel the warfare waging against your, 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 your family, your faith, the faith of your loved ones, the faith of your friends, and you're exhausted. You're exhausted. How do you respond? You respond by running to Jesus for rest. You would run to Jesus for rest, but with your boots on, with your head held high, eyes fixed on the cross. Come to him for rest, restoration, encouragement, so that you can get back in the war. Rest, rejuvenation, is not for us to sit on the sidelines, but so that we can be restored back to get back on the field. Jesus wants to to, to walk with you, all of you, wherever you're at. If you're struggling with your faith, you're struggling to believe, you're repenting of sin, you're becoming a Christian for the first time, or you're, you're exhausted and need rest. And so I need us to see, as we close, 
that you're part of, if you're a Christian, Jesus has invited you to be part of the greatest mission in human history. Additionally, I want to help you, and I want to, we want to help you uh, remember this great news, and we're going to do so through the taking of communion. We're going to remember the link that Jesus went to save you. And here's my prayer, just as Paul started this. He says, I thank him who has given me strength. I pray this, that Jesus Christ would give you strength. As you look upon the cross of Christ, you look upon the leak that Jesus went to save you, that you'd marvel at the great mercy and grace in Jesus, and you would realize that Jesus, there's more mercy and grace in Jesus than sin in you, that Jesus indeed came to save sinners, and that he has sent you out to wage a good warfare. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I ask that you bless these men and women as they respond. Would you continue to speak to their hearts? Would you... Allow us to remember that there's more mercy and grace in you, Jesus, than sin in us. That we are indeed in a war, uh, and it's not against flesh and blood, but, but there are attacks on our mind. That, that there is a reality that, that there will be casualties along the way. Lord, we pray for those who, who are struggling uh, with their faith, that you would strengthen their faith right now. And for those who have gone astray, Lord, would you bring them home? And would you, would you bring them back? Would we all see that, Jesus, your mercy and grace are so mighty, so powerful, so abounding, that it would overflow to us right now as we respond and overflow through us as we live our lives this week? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.